In this video, we're going to go over nine types of reading language arts questions that they'll ask on the test. Now, one technique here is you could just answer the questions about a particular excerpt, because then you don't have to read the full story. Or if they mention a particular paragraph, you could just read that one paragraph and answer the question. So that's what we're going to focus on here. For this one, how does the author's use of wavered give information about Mindy? Mindy wavered in her response about whether she enjoyed her friend show. But if somebody wavers, that means they hesitate. And if you hesitate in responding whether you enjoyed something, you probably didn't enjoy it. So let's see which of these would match. The first one, the phrase reveals her concealed enthusiasm. But if she was enthusiastic, she wouldn't have hesitated, so it's not the first one. The next one, the phrase reveals her internal conflict. And if you're conflicted whether to be honest with somebody or not, you may waver or hesitate. So B, that definitely seems like the best option, and that's it here. Okay, let's check out another one. For this one, we're just going to focus on paragraph 5 here. What is the author's tone in paragraph 5? Now tone, that's the same thing as the author's attitude. And you can find it based on the words that they use to describe a subject. So let's see. Despite Food and Drug Administration oversight, there are safety concerns about several common food additives. Some additives in use today contain ingredients such as sodium nitrate, sulfites, paraben, and butane. There are additional concerns surrounding packaging material, which may leach into products. So we may notice they mention safety concerns in the first sentence, and in the last sentence, additional concerns. In other words, it's definitely an attitude of concern. So let's see which of these conveys that. Well, the first one, optimistic, that just means hopeful, and that's not really it. The next one, defeated, that means you're overwhelmed by something. And there are a lot of ingredients to be overwhelmed by, so that's a possibility. The third one, apologetic, that means regretful. And that's not really the tone here, so that's out. And then cautious, that means to be careful. And there are a lot of things to be careful about or concerned about. So cautious, that seems to be the author's tone or the author's attitude towards food additives here. Okay, let's check out another. Now this one's from the same paragraph here. How does the list of ingredients help the author achieve her purpose? Now because we know the tone is one of concern, then the purpose is probably trying to convey that concern. So let's find these ingredients here. Sodium nitrate, sulfites, paraben, and butane. Even if we don't know what these things are, you might have heard of butane and that's a gas. We definitely don't want that to be a food additive, so that is concerning. So which of these conveys that type of concern? The first one, by illustrating the complexity of food chemistry, not exactly, so that's out. The next one, by shifting focus towards organic products. They might do that in another paragraph, but they don't do it for this one. So once again, that's out. The third one, by emphasizing potential health hazards, and that seems to fit the best. We probably shouldn't be eating these things, they're not good for our health, so again, we're concerned or worrisome that they're in there. So, you can get all the information just from that one paragraph, and that's it. Now we may have to skip ahead a little bit to find another question about a particular paragraph. What inference can the reader make based on the details of paragraph 2 here? Now an inference, that's to read between the lines, or what is the author really saying here? In other words, which of these things can we conclude based on evidence from this passage. Self-driving cars must be programmed how to respond in the event of an accident. Should a self-driving car hit one pedestrian to save two motorists? Survey participants agreed that cars should be designed to protect the most people. But those opinions changed when people imagined actually buying a self-driving car, in which case, most participants admitted they wanted the car to be programmed to protect its passengers. 
So just to summarize, when people were surveyed, they initially wanted it designed to protect the most amount of people, the self-driving car that is. But when they imagined actually buying the car, they really wanted it to protect its passengers and themselves. So what can we conclude here? The first one, values become clear and consistent with proper research. But the problem is, it's not consistent because people's opinions were changing. So therefore, that's not going to be it. The next one, morality becomes complicated due to self-preservation. Now, self-preservation, that means you only want to protect yourself. And that is how people felt when they imagined buying the car. Therefore, it complicated the morality of initially wanting to save the most people, but then just really wanting to save yourself. So B, that's an excellent inference here, or something that we can conclude based on the evidence here. For this one, what generalization can be made based on paragraph 3? Now a generalization, that's just a broad statement claiming that something is always true. So let's check it out. Early cars known as horseless carriages were perceived with skepticism by the public. Laws were restrictive, and the initial speed limit was only 4 miles per hour. They were highly dangerous for their passengers. They didn't have electric headlights until 1889, speedometers until 1901, turn signals until the 1930s, and seatbelts until the 1960s. Airbags didn't exist commonly until 1973. So the first one, the public always fears new technology. Well, there is evidence for that, because they were perceived with skepticism initially, so that's a possibility. The next one, public hysteria or fear, creates overly cautious laws. Again, there is evidence for that because laws were restrictive since people had fear about them. So again, another possibility. The third one, safety regulations evolve slowly over time. But there's definitely the most evidence for this one because we're given five examples of how that is true. In other words, the more examples, the better the generalization. So C, that's definitely the best option here. For this one, how does the phrase hit a home run add to the meaning of the ideas expressed in paragraph 4? Our meal kits make dinner prep a no-brainer. With classic flavors that your whole family will enjoy, all 50 of our recipes are simple, quick, and nutritious. Whether cooking for yourself or for the whole family, you'll hit a home run, there's that phrase, every time you're up at bat for making dinner. Use promo code EASYMEALS to receive 60% off your first order with free same-day shipping. So again, how does that add to the meaning here? The first one, it emphasizes a team effort. But hitting a home run in baseball, that's just something one person does. It's not a team effort. So it's not that one. The next one, it links cooking with exercise. Well, they don't really mention exercise anywhere, so that's probably not it. The third one, it exaggerates shipping speed. But they don't mention shipping until the sentence after that one, so it's probably not that either. But the last one, it heightens the success. And this one makes the most sense. Because hitting a home run, that's the most successful thing you can do, when you're up at bat for baseball. But they're making the analogy, you're up at bat for making dinner, you hit a home run, therefore the meal is a success. So the last one, that's a great example of how we could use that. And this is an example of an idiom. Another example is to break a leg, because it doesn't actually mean that. It really just means you're wishing somebody good luck. So if you're not actually doing that thing, but it means something else, that's usually called an idiom. For this one, what word would the narrator, that's the person telling the story, use to describe the shopkeeper in paragraph 6? No one in town sells better ingredients, he said. Our fresh saffron and sumac, the shopkeeper continued, are night and day from what you'd get at the grocery store. This shop dates back three generations. My great-grandparents moved here from Lebanon, and built this into a neighborhood staple. So it seems like he's taking a lot of pride, 
no one in town sells better ingredients, and there's a lot of family history to also be proud about. So which of these means proud? The first one, boastful, that does mean excessive pride. But let's pretend you didn't know that, you can still find it with process of elimination. Because unpredictable, that means random. And he's not being random, he's just being friendly and talkative, so that's not it. Modest, that means you don't brag. But he's definitely bragging about how good the shop is, so that's out. And irrational, that means not being reasonable. But he seems really reasonable, again just friendly, so that's out. So all of that points to boastful, and that's having a lot of pride. Often you'll have two people debating each other. For this one, how does Miller use rhetorical questions in paragraph 8 to support her argument? Now rhetorical questions, they're ones that you don't actually answer. They're just used to create a dramatic effect, especially in a debate. So for this one, in terms of his idea that social media simply connects us together, doesn't he realize that moral outrage posts are more popular than any other? Has he not seen the research correlating poor mental health with extensive screen time? So it seems like Miller's opponent has this idea that social media simply connects us together. But she's using questions to counter that. Doesn't he realize that moral outrage posts or angry posts are more popular than any other? And that implies that social media does not simply connect us because we're getting angry at each other. Furthermore, poor mental health is linked with extensive screen time, so again, not just simply connecting us together. So how are these questions being used? She uses them to oppose potential objections to her argument, but it's not her argument, it's actually her opponent's argument. So B, that's going to summarize it. These questions are being used to point out faults in her opponent's argument. So this is a great option, and that's how they're being used here. And you made it, just one last one. You often have to replace one word with another and see how it changes the meaning. Replacing the word accidental with careless in paragraph 7 would change the meaning of the sentence to suggest that Credit Plus's attitude towards their credit team is which of these. At Credit Plus, we pride ourselves on our relationship with every member. Over the past several weeks, our credit team placed, here's that word, accidental, holds on our card members' accounts when their balance has dropped below $500. Now, if they're accidental, it's nobody's fault. But then if it's careless, that means the credit team was just not being careful. In other words, they're to blame for that mistake. So which of these is going to place blame? The first one, indifferent, that means unconcerned, but that's not the case. Incensed, that means furious, but they might use stronger language like unbelievable or unforgivable if they were furious. The next one, accusatory, and that's condemning. And they are condemning their credit team for being careless and making the mistake. So see, that's definitely it. But just be careful because apologetic. They were regretful, but they were regretful to their members, not to their credit team. So again, they're being accusatory of their own staff here, and that's it. So once you answer all the questions about specific paragraphs, you can answer a lot of questions very quickly. Then you can go back, read the full passages, and answer the rest of them after that. So I hope this technique gives you a lot of confidence going into the test. Let me know what questions you have. Check out my website for some additional practice problems. Good luck. You got these. We'll see you in the next video. Toodles.